All right. Our guest this week is a, a name you probably know. You've probably heard a little bit, but uh, uh, I think his his track record and what he helped accomplish for UCF, I think maybe people probably don't know about. And uh, he had such an instrumental role in, in the success that we had at UCF. He was only there a couple of seasons, of, unfortunately, uh, but uh, I think he left his imprint uh, and he's uh, a legend in the coaching industry. He's been around uh, for, for a long time, had a lot of great success. And uh, we were lucky enough to have him for a couple of seasons at UCF. And we're lucky enough to have him on the show tonight. Former UCF quarterback coach Mario Verdusco has been kind enough to hop in and join us. First off, coach, appreciate you for taking some time and uh, joining us on the show tonight. Absolutely. Pleasure. Great talking with you guys. All right. Well, I always like to start at the beginning. So looking at your bio, you're you're in Missouri uh, right around there, December 2015. And you're the yes. you know, you're the OC QB coach and yep. a young Scott Frost gets the job at UCF. Uh, and then uh, some what, 10 days later, you're announced as the quarterback coach. So take us through that period of time. How did you get connected with Coach Frost? How did you decide to come to UCF? What kind of research did you do do before you decided to take the job? Well, I Coach Frost coached with us at Northern Iowa did a tremendous job for us there. Um, and that's where I first met him. Right. And, um, then I went to, uh, Missouri state with a good friend of mine by the name of Dave Steckel. And it was interesting because at their respective universities, Dave was at Steck was at Missouri and Frosty was at Oregon and they were both up for the, um, coach of the year awards. Right. And it was interesting. I get a call one night and uh, they uh, probably had a few cocktails and they were talking about if they ever became head coaches, who they would hire first. And my name came up. So that was kind of interesting. It just so happened that I, Dave got the head job and asked me to, to come and I did. And um, when Coach Frost got the job at, at uh, UCF, I think it was, uh, we were out recruiting, to, it was towards the end of the year, and he called me on the phone and asked if I wanted to go. And I said, Coach Frost, I just have one request. If you could call Steck and ask for permission to talk to me, I said, I would really appreciate that because I had a lot of loyalty to Steck. We've been good friends for a long time, going back to our days at Rutgers. And um, so he called uh, Steck and called me back on the phone. We talked about it and I decided to go and called Steck on the phone. And that was it. And then I got to, I got to uh, UCF probably, I think it was December 8th of 2015. So as you know, the coaching profession's crazy. So I was in, in Missouri for maybe about nine, 10 months. That was it. Did you do any research on UCF? Did you look it up or was it like, hey, Frost is on the phone. He's saying he's going there. I'm going with him. That was it. That was, that was, you know, I didn't really need to do any research. He, he filled me in a little bit about it, but that didn't, that, that wasn't going to put a nail in the coffin or anything like that. You know, it was, it was a good opportunity. I knew a little bit about the school and the history of UCF just from, all the things you guys are well aware of, you know? Um, and um, yeah, and I took off, man. I was gone. <laughs> did, did he mention that UCF was winless in 2015? Did you know yeah, that you were coming you know, into a school that did not win a game the year before? Yeah, you know, he, he talked me through that a little bit. Um, but, you know, that wasn't an issue. The, the one thing he had mentioned is he, he felt like the roster was really talented. And he, he was right about that. Now we had our deficiencies as all teams do, you know that, and you got to try to <clears throat> get things put together and so on and so forth. And, um, but he felt confident uh, about the talent that was there and what we could, what we could do there. So um, yeah, he, he, he went through most of that stuff when we talked on the phone. Did he tell you about this, Hot shot freshman quarterback he was bringing in from Hawaii, Mackenzie Milton. No, that was it. That was that was an interesting that was an interesting story. You know, so when I got there, I was probably one of the first guys on staff. I think there, maybe the first. I don't know, but Frosty was busy doing his head coaching things, and he said, "Hey, Berdu, what I'd like you to do is 
go through and see what what quarterbacks are out there for us and so on and so forth. So obviously I did that and went through all the, the videos and the tapes and the whole shooting match. So um, I see this young guy from Hawaii and I'm like, who in God's green earth is this cat? <laughs> I mean, he was really dynamic, right? But, you know, smallish, which never bothered me. I don't think that has to anything to do with anything in the long scheme of things because you don't throw over anybody. You know, you're throwing between the trees. So I go into Frosty's office. I said, God, Frosty, I said, who's who's this young cat, Mackenzie Milton? He goes, you like him? I said, dude, man, I mean, he is freaking dynamic now. Well, Frosty had a connection with him uh, during his time at Oregon because KZ had, had come to some of the camps they had there at Oregon. So Frosty was aware of him. And I said, do you think we have a chance to get him and so on and so forth? Well, we went through the whole process and it was great that, you know, that he ended up coming to UCF, but that was an interesting story how that all took place. Yeah. Obviously the talent was there. You could see the you know, flashes of just dynamic play, like you said, but I, I think his first year, he wasn't the most accurate quarterback. You know, you saw that. And what were some of the things mechanically you had to work on with him? Well, there was a, couple things if you remember about kz man you know there he just sometimes was so careless with the ball right and that obviously drove me nuts drove frosty nuts but when he did when he did take over it was interesting because holman had gotten hurt and i remember we were in a staff meeting and frosty asked you know is is kz raid go I said, absolutely, he's ready to go. And the reason, only reason I knew that from a cognitive standpoint, you know, he, he, he did really, really well on his playbook test. You know, I said he scored like 87 or 89%, whatever it was. So I knew cognitively he knew what we were doing. You know, I, that was an objective answer. It wasn't, I wasn't pulling some BS out of my butt, you know, about it. So we knew he was ready to go there, and I told Frosty, you know, we're going to have to suffer through just some of the things you suffer through when a young guy's trying to – he knows how to drive the car, but he hasn't driven it. You know what I'm saying? And mechanically, when he wanted to generate a tremendous amount of thrust on the ball, he would let his, his elbow kind of dip below his, his shoulder joint. And as a result, he experienced – a boatload of high ball errors when he wanted to do that. Well, it was, it was an easy fix. And we got that, we got that taken care of. Right. Uh, obviously, you know, he had to learn the drop back mechanics and all that sort of stuff, but that, that stuff's easy to teach. And it was easy to fix his mechanics. It just takes time, you know, um, once you identify the problem and, um, once that happened, I think he probably experienced maybe maybe one or two high ball errors his second year. So, um, but he was he was a, a really dynamic player. And the thing that we it was he was such an interesting cat, man. Just loved the dude. We talked, you know, to this day, and I know he's up at Tennessee and whatnot. But he's such a beautiful young character. And the one thing that really you know, you can talk to a guy about ball security, you got to take care of the ball and the problem with turnovers and all that sort of stuff, right? From a football standpoint, you can do that, right? And it, for some reason, that that it didn't kind of click in his head for whatever reason, you know? <laughs> so one day I told him, I said, you know, KZ, you are the worst teammate in the world, dude. You're just horrible as a teammate. And that, man, I tell you what, that put a dagger in his freaking heart now. He, he didn't like that, you know? That, that really, and from that moment on, that part of his profile changed because, you know, you can see those sorts of things in practice, right? They just don't all of a sudden show up in a game, you know, <laughs> they happen in practice. And from that moment on, uh, uh, after that first year, uh, he was, he was really conscious of it, you know, and did a nice job for us in that area. Yeah, I think we all remember that Maryland game in 2016 when he had, like, what, five or six fumbles uh, Rudy, in, he, in that he one He tried game. to pitch the ball behind his back, man. I'm like, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> you know? No. 
And then Frosty would be like, Mario, what's he doing? Well, hell, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> Frick, I wanted to strangle him sometimes, you know. Well, take us back in that QB room that you walked to, walked into in 16, right? Obviously, you had KZ coming in. You had Nick Patty. You had Justin yep. Holman who had been there. While you had Tyler Harris who was there. You had Pete yeah, Nova who was there. Yes. How did, how, take us through that quarterback competition. Obviously, you got a bunch of new guys. You're a new staff. You're trying to learn. What were, what were the things that you were kind of looking for as you evaluated that 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 room? Because people forget, you started Holman earlier in that season. So, I guess, evaluate that room for us. And how did you guys land on Holman as the opening day starter? Well, you know, he was a returner. Um from an objective standpoint, you know, you, you're going to evaluate those guys in four areas of their lives as players, right? And you don't want to make a subjective decision about it, correct? You want to be as objective as you possibly can so that when Coach Frost asks me for the depth chart, I can, you know, I can give it to him, right? And this is how it works. So, you know, you have, you, you evaluate objectively their uh, ability to understand the offense. So you're going to give them a playbook test, right? That makes sense. Correct. Sure. True. Which is the cognitive domain of learning. You're going to evaluate the physical domain of learning. Let's just say their work in the weight room, their work ethic there and their attention to detail with regard to that and their level of intensity when they step in the weight room and what they're doing with their lifts. In addition to that, their, their quarterback drill work, what's happening with that, and you evaluate that and you go through that piece of the puzzle, which is dictated by biomechanics and motor learning and control. You evaluate their effective domain, you know, how they are as teammates, correct? Yeah. So those four domains are evaluated and they and the guys would get a grade, right? And I would document it for them, would have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. They would get a copy of the of their grades in the report, and I would send one to the parents as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you put all that information together, and you evaluate practice from week to week. And it just so happened that that um, Holman earned the right to be the starter. Yes, it sure. wasn't given to him because he was a returner or any of that sort of business. And it just so happened that as things went through practice and through the year that KZ ended up being number two on the depth chart. Right? Yeah. Because the limiting factor for guys is, as quarterbacks really isn't their ability to play. I, from a physical standpoint, throwing the ball, running, and all that sort of business. Correct? Right? Sure. It's that way when guys leave college to go to the NFL you've evaluated and you drafted them, did whatever. So they've demonstrated on tape, at least the ability to function from a physical standpoint with skill wise within the framework of the offense. So what's the limiting factor for those guys? Well, as I would tell them, I said, the limiting factor is going to be how Casey, how fast can you make our offense in your brain, in your mind, the understanding, just like it was in high school. I said, you knew your high school offense forward and backwards, didn't you? Yeah, I did, Coach. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes people kind of don't understand the reason for the playbook test. <laughs> but just imagine, just imagine if you sign a young guy in February, right? Yeah. And you don't do any work with him from that standpoint. You don't send him a playbook. He doesn't get a playbook test and so on and so forth. So you, so he has a, an actual understanding of what's required for him when he comes into fall camp. Well, you end up wasting February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, almost 12 months of cognitive learning time until he's a, he comes into the next spring because they learn the offense by osmosis, which is stupid to me. It, it makes absolutely, it's the dumbest thing I've ever witnessed in my life. And so this sort of process goes back to my days when I was coaching high school ball. So that's how the, that's how the depth chart got established. You know, um, it, it's by objectively evaluating those cats in each of those four domains of learning. Can you, can you, could you can imagine, right? You got four guys, let's just say four guys. And all things being equal, they're all great. There, but there's the one guy, he just will not 
go to his workouts or he misses them or he's late. Or when he's in the weight room, he just doesn't have the intensity. Well, you guys know as well as I do, a lot of your um, sort of camaraderie and the, the, the stick to itiveness and the togetherness begins in the weight room, right? Sure. Yeah. Well, how can your how can you have your quarterback being a disaster in the weight room? <laughs> uh, you know, it won't. It may last a certain amount of time, but not. Altogether, it's going to bite you in the ass at some point. All things being equal, you got a guy who he doesn't he doesn't know one pass play from another, right? He can't identify his he can't drop the patterns and he can't drop any of the routes and he doesn't know the meaning. Of, how can you put that some bitch on the field, <laughs> right? You know, well, from an objective standpoint, right? Well, just think about the effective domain. Well, he's good in all areas, but he's a pain in the ass. He's a dick to his teammates right? He won't go to class and he's always in freaking trouble. Well, that guy's unreliable. Hmm. Do you understand the point? That I'm trying to yeah. Make? yeah. That's how that stuff and how I've always done it. So that when the head coach came to me and said, what's the depth chart? Well, this is the depth chart and this, and this is exactly why. Now, if they have a different feeling about it, okay, that's fine, but you're going to make your determination in terms of what you want to do and how you want to do it. But this is, I'm your quarterback coach. This is what I'm telling you. This is what's been uh, objectively evaluated. And so now when the quarterbacks, when they're deal when I'm dealing with the court, they know, man, <laughs> they know there's no bullshit about it. Yeah. Right. They, they know exactly where they stand and why they stand where they stand. Right? Well, obviously you were familiar with, with coach Fraud. What does it, what does it take for a quarterback to run that system? What, what are the skills the quarterback has to have? What, what does somebody have to have to sort of be effective in running that system? Uh, you know, aside from all the, the, the physical skills necessary um, to, to run that style of offense, we wanted a guy who was athletic, didn't have to be Michael Vick fast, but he had, you know, he had to be, he had to demonstrate the ability to get a first down when it's third and seven with his feet, let's just say. Okay. And because the offense is up tempo and all the sorts of things that are going with it, he has to be pretty nimble in terms of his, his, his brain, his mind, uh, quick thinker. And we used the phrase, Frosty coined the phrase, you know, he had to be a quick blinker, you know, <laughs> I think you guys understand what we mean by a quick blinker. Um, you know, I would say those are the that that was the one thing that can kind of be an intangible. You know, right? You can get a guy to be as man. You can get him as good as you can, but man, sometimes there's guys that are just they're just wired up for it. You know, but you do as much as you possibly can as a quarterback coach to eliminate all those sorts of variables that you have no control over knowing that they do that they do exist right we spoke to mckenzie a couple times and he told us that during those two years i don't think you guys ever ran the same play out of the same formation more than once how is that possible at, at, and how in depth was that playbook well you know at when they're at Oregon, uh, when they ran, when they're running fast, you know, when that, I mean, when that was going lightning speed, th there might be uh, a distribution of, let's say, off the top of my head, let's say just 25 plays on, on that particular menu. Correct. Uh, right. Yeah. So you can, you can kind of manage that. Right. You do it over and you start in fall camp and, hey, this is the menu. When we're going fast, this is going to be it. And you have all kinds of ways to do it, so on and so forth. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Well, after our first year, Frosty wanted to expand that so that we would be able to do the entire playbook. And he said, Mario, is that possible? I said, yeah, we'll do whatever you want to do, man. I'll, we'll get it done. I'll teach him the global system and they're going to be able to, to function and think about things like you do, coach. Right. Like I would as the quarterback coach or like Troy Walters as the offensive coordinator, so on and so forth. So they had to <clears throat> they, they had to be coached and taught in a way. So they had full access to the playbook in their noodle. Right. 
and as a result, you know, they have, you got to know all your formations. You got to know all the routes. You got to know all the patterns and they have to be able to uh, be able to identify that stuff, right? That they know it because learning, you know, you can only infer that learnings take. And the only way you infer it is by giving them a test to see if they know what the hell you, what you're talking about and what they need to know. Correct. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. True. So did, did he have the freedom to change plays? Like McKenzie, as a true freshman. Yeah. There, there is a, I understand your question. And because there's answers that are built into the plays, there, there really was no need for that. You know, it's, it's not a big audible system. Uh, I spent most of my life in, in the West Coast offense, right? And, you know, despite the fact there's answers that are built into plays, there's that opportunity to change plays at the line of scrimmage or kill plays or alert plays or just change the whole thing from the beginning if you see a blitz and so on and so forth, correct? But in in our offense at that particular point in time, the answers were, were for the most part, built in. I don't know if that, that answers your question for you. Well, I mean, he sees what's lined up and he has an option maybe between one or two things. Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. So if there was a, whether it was a coverage change or difference or one high versus two high, or if they were showing pressure, they were showing blitz, there was typically an answer built into the, into the play that we call whether it was a run or a pass. And because you're playing so – you guys know as well as I do, man, the, 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 job, the, the key in offensive football is get some big defense to play vanilla, right? Yeah. That, I mean, that's what you want to do. Now, how do you do that? Well, in motion, you shift, you play fast or whatever. Um, but that's what you're essentially trying to do so that they, they have to give you the same look basically over and over again, right? They, they can't change things on you. And it's no different in, in modern warfare. You know, if you know, if you know where your enemy is and you know when they're going to be there, then you have a chance to attack them. If you have a chance to attack them, you have a chance to, to knock them out, you know? So, um, yeah, it, it was a, it was a, a fun offense to be involved with in a lot of ways, similar to coach Walsh's offense in a lot of ways, different. Coach, how did you keep McKenzie uh, that first season? I mean, there's a lot of ups and downs, right? I mean, UConn, he throws for 300 yards and three touchdowns and a win. Next week, Houston, we lose. He throws for 155, two touch, two interceptions. Next week, we win. <laughs> he only throws for 85 yards and an interception. How did you kind of manage the ups and downs with a freshman quarterback who has, has a great game one week and the next week only has 45% completion percentage? I'll give you an I, I, The Houston game. I mean, it's freaking unbelievable. I mean, we're 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 getting after him now. We're doing pretty good, right? And we're second half. We're up on him. I said, KZ, listen, man, we're in great shape. Defense is lights out. All we gotta do is just be smart, do what you've been doing, take care of the damn football, and we'll get out of here with the win, man. Just just be smart. <laughs> and he goes out second half, man. I'm like, what are we doing? <laughs> right. And the worst thing that you can do, I think for any quarterback, I was raised this way, uh, being that I grew up so close to Stanford University when Bill Walsh first got there and you couldn't help but feel his influence about a lot of different things, particularly with regards to coaching quarterbacks and football in general. The worst thing you can do is you start screaming and yelling at him, hmm. right? Yeah. You, you'll kill him. So my guys understood my pet peeves, the things that would just drive me up a freaking wall, right? Sore arms and lack of work ethic, right? There's always going to be turnovers. What you're, what you're, what you are attempting to do desperately is prevent stupid turnovers. That's, that's what you want to do. And when you when you're having turnovers because you're careless, okay, we we have, we have to address that. Well, you're being a bad teammate. Get that cleaned up, right? Um, or you know, if you have a quarterback that you know he, he doesn't know where to put his eyeballs. <laughs> if you don't know where to put your eyeballs, man. You can't play the position, dude. <laughs> well, you got to learn the playbook. Is what, the point I'm trying to make. 
So dealing with him through that, uh, and 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 Coach Frost was great. You know, he was he was basically on the same on the same page with regards to that in terms of how to, he played quarterback, so he understood the issues that are associated when you just start pounding on a guy, right? So um, you just have to be supportive and objective. Now, having said that, the other pet peeve is making the same mistake over and over and over and over and over and over. That that. So, I mean, I got after his ass one day on practice now, man. I went berserk. I was so irritated with him. I wanted to strangle his ass, you know, to the point where Frosty looked over and thought I was going to have a conniption or something, you know. <laughs> so, and – as you get through it, then, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll come and tell you, yeah, I deserved it coach. I, I, you know, I deserve that. And it won't happen again. Hmm. Let's talk about that team. We, we were six and four heading yeah. into sort of that, that, that home stretch there. We lose the last two of the regular season, uh, at, at home at Tulsa and obviously away at the cows. And then the bowl game, the cure bowl was, was obviously just a, a tough performance overall. We, we lose that one. What, what kind of happened in that season? I think again, coming off a winless season, six and four UCF Andrew ecstatic, but felt like there was some more meat on the bone there. What, what sort of happened towards the tail end of the season that you think led to that slide? Well, you know, uh, Greg Austin did it. I can just speak for the offensive side of the football, right? And, um, Greg Austin is just a tremendous offensive line coach. Outstanding, right? Awesome. Great with his guys. Just awesome. And, you know, we, we had some limitations there that he did a great job of, um, I wouldn't say hide them, but he just did a great job of coaching those guys to be a, an absolutely cohesive bunch. Right? So as a result, sort of masked those sorts of problems. But sometimes the weight of those problems are just too much, right? And to sustain that level of, of success can be hard over a period of time. Um, so they started kind of rearing their ugly head towards the end of the season <laughs> and, and the bull game, you know, it was... Wow, that was yeah, that was a, that was a tough game, you know. And I remember the fans were, you know, they were booing McKenzie, right? Yeah. I don't know if you guys remember that. Sure, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Game's over. I'm walking in. I got I'm walking with McKenzie, and we we're entering the locker room. You know, I, I look over. How you doing, man? He goes, Hey, coach. You know, he has that sort of crazy Hawaiian accent. Hey, coach. <laughs> Fans are crazy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, fans are crazy, McKenzie. And that's he had a smile on his face about it. You know, he didn't like it, but he yeah. he, he got it, you know. He he got it. He was a very even keel, mature in a lot of ways beyond his years in, in some respects. Yeah, he's talked a lot about that, how that sort of changed him a little bit. But there there is some drama that offseason, right? Because because he goes back to Hawaii. And then rumors start floating around that maybe he's not coming back. He's not sure if he wants to come back. I think he's even admitted, you know, he was being a little bit immature at that point and, you know, <laughs> was, wasn't there for workouts and, and whatnot. W what was your perspective kind of watching all that unfold? And did you think he was going to come back? Were you surprised when he, when he decided to come back? What was your sort of take as, no, as all we, that was going on? No, we talked, we talked on the phone um, through that entire period, you know, and um, I think, um, Casey had deep affection for me, right? I think because how I, how we do things in, as coaching quarterbacks, it wasn't, like I said, the subjectivity is, is bled out of the, the evaluation as much as possible, right? So, you know, he was going through things that were kind of got him off kilter a little bit, right? And the more we talked, the more comfortable he felt. Um, and then, you know, decided to come back and all was well, so to speak. Do you think there's a chance maybe he wouldn't come back? Was there a time where you concerned that maybe he was going to leave? When, when, when I talked to him on the phone, there was never a thought because Coach Frost asked me the same thing. And I, I was confident he was going to come back and everything was going to be fine. 
Well, when we walked off the field after that Cure Bowl, we finished the season six and seven. Like you said, the fans were booing McKenzie and everything. Did you ever think, if I told you that team was going to go undefeated the next year, what would you have said to me? I would have said if we – I would have answered you this way. If we could get the, the pieces in the puzzle that we need, we got a great chance of being real successful. To be undefeated, you guys know how difficult that is, man. It, Pop Warner football, it's hard. <laughs> I mean, things just have to go go right. Well, when we remember when we played SMU and it was fourth and three or whatever the hell it was, and yeah. they got the ball. I think I don't know. I think they're like on the plus thirty five or something going in. And the their guy who had, had never dropped the ball drops the ball on fourth and three, whatever it was. And sometimes, uh, as you guys know, when if you're going to have an undefeated season, you have to have you have to have a, a, the football gods have to be on your, your on your side <laughs> at, at certain points. You know, there's a there's a little little luck involved, right? Did you notice any big change from McKenzie coming in the, the, the next year? Obviously, he made a huge jump that south that sophomore year. Was there something different you saw him in the preseason and leading up to the the, uh, the start of the year? From an effective standpoint, uh, no, he was always a great kid. Never, never a problem that way. Um, no issues there. Uh, the physical domain part. Um, I always stayed in great contact with our strength guys. Uh, Coach Duvall, we talked. I, I was always going to be in there to make certain, even his first year, that are they doing what you're asking them to do, Coach Duvall? Because if they're not, someone's ass is going to roll. And then I would go to Coach Duvall and say, well, give me their grades. I would give him a sheet and say, this is what I would like evaluated objectively. And he gave me all their lists and so on and so forth, right? From a psychomotor standpoint, skill-wise, you know, that domain of learning, it was, it was getting his stroke fixed with, when he wanted to generate a tremendous amount of thrust on the ball, right? That, he felt really good about that. And then with regard to all the, the drill work that we do, um, every quarterback in the country, no matter what level they're all at, wants Mo Flava. And what we mean by that is the ability to generate maximal, optimal, final, linear velocity accurately, right, with the ball. That's, that's, what, they all, that's what, they, what's what we all want, man. They all want that. Well, how do you get that? How do you do that? How do you coach that, right? From both the motor behavior standpoint, learning control standpoint, how do you teach it? And then what are the bio, what, are, what are the mechanical, biomechanical issues, right, that you can identify to help them just get every ounce of energy out of their body when they're throwing it, just like Coach Walsh the same, did for Joe Montana. Joe wasn't the biggest guy in the world, right? And... Once we got that boy, then he felt great. And 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 with the drill work, he his arm got stronger. He was the final linear velocity just increased, right? And he became more accurate and was able to generate more thrust on the ball. Cognitively, that wasn't shit. He was good to go, man. <laughs> I mean, I knew that from the get-go. Somebody scores 80 some points on his I mean, 722 questions on that some bitch. <laughs> you know, and he killed it. So I would say then that final piece of the puzzle for him was, dude, you're just being a bad teammate. Take care of the ball. That was, that was it. That, 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 that took care of the few issues that he did have as a, as a quarterback. Well, Coach, you said uh, walking off that field in 16 that you would have said we could have done great in 17 if we fixed a few things and shorted some things up. What, what were those things that, in your view, had to get fixed heading into that 2017 season? I, I think we had some uh, limitations up front off, off on the offensive off, offensive line, you know. And because of the style, you're going from one style of offense – as you guys know, with Coach O'Leary, is different than the offense that we played, right? Sure. So there, there's going to be some just some natural gaps. You can't – it's just how it's going to be, just from the standpoint of the type of quarterback you recruit. 
let's just say for that, right? Sure. The type of offensive lineman, let's say you recruit or you get. So there was, there were some things that we just felt like we, we needed to shore up and the speed factor is big in, 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 in the offense, right? In that style of offense. So then we get killings in those cats, you know, <laughs> I'm guys who could run. We, yeah. we wanted guys who could freaking run, who are athletic. And the great thing about Florida, man, is that the Florida guys love playing now. I mean, they love playing football. I mean, they just love it. They, you guys know that probably better than anybody in the country. You guys see it all the time, right? If we can get them now and we can say, okay, guys, I, you may not like to practice as much as you like to play when the lights are on, but let's get after it. And man, it was, well, once we got those pieces put together, we felt, like I said, that's how I would have answered your question. If we could get those things shored up, would would, would be successful. Well, it was kind of a weird start to the season. There was a hurricane that canceled the second game. We we blow at FIU, which was uh, probably expected, right? Hurricane to cancel the second game. Then we go to Maryland, Big Ten country, and that was when. As oh, are a you fan, talking about? Are you talking about the second year? Yeah, I'm talking about 2017. Yeah, 2017. Well, and here's a, interest, and here's the interesting thing about that FIU game. I don't know if you guys remember that KZ was on fire though. Sure. On fire. So we're down on the we're down on the uh, fifth yard line maybe the plus 20 going in early in the game right and so we're running a route where you got basically kind of three verticals correct yeah sure so as a quarterback all I'm, all you want to do is is the tube open you know between the hashes if that zone bitch is open let's let it rip if it's closed then bring the ball outside right you feel me i feel you yeah they i mean they blitz is that they're, they're blitzing now and so they've got basically four dbs 10 yards on the line. And KZ's just, I know what he's thinking. Because we, right? They blitz. The guy goes down the tube. KZ puts it up. Touchdown. Bang. Didn't have to worry about a damn thing. He gets his side and I said, KZ, do you understand what we're talking about now? With three verticals, is the tube open? He goes, God, coach, it's easy. Just a little snippet about that little piece of the puzzle with him in, 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 in those sorts of moments. But go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, you. no, he, he was 16 to 21 for 360 and four touchdowns in that, yeah. and that FIU game. That was pretty good. But I think for me, the, the game that really kind of caught my attention, going to Maryland again, Big 12, Big 10 country, and we, we blew Maryland out. It was, it was 28, it was 28 or 38 10 rather. And that's when I, I don't know about, I know Mike and I talk about this a lot. That's when as a fan, you kind of look around and said, okay, hey, we might have something here. This this might be this might be a team. When did you as a coach say to yourself, hey, I we, we've got something special here. I think we can really, really do some damage this year. Well, I I you know, that's a that is a freaking great question. And I'm sure you asked that of a lot of coaches, but for for me, it was during practice. Mm-hmm. You know, you can I mean Chin, Chin's defense is I mean, we had some cats over there now, <laughs> as you remember. Sure. Right. And so during practice, when we started doing the things we were doing in practice that we weren't able to do the year before against Chins, I felt, okay, man, now we just now we just got to get in games and, and put it together. And the FIU game comes up, and I, I didn't have this feeling like we should blow FIU out or anything like that. You know, I'm always scared pissless of going in any game and – God, are we going to complete a pass? And that's how <laughs> crazy I am about it. <laughs> and he just he just was on fire, and, and he was seeing everything. He was taking care of the ball, making the right decisions. And I felt the way he was playing in concert with the guys around him and the supporting staff, because as a, as a quarterback, you guys know, you know, they talk about a quarterback's winning records, the dumbest ass stat in the history of mankind, as far as I'm concerned. It's the greatest team game in the world, right? And you're going to talk about a quarterback's winning record. It makes no freaking sense. So his ability to play with the concert in concert with the rest of the guys and the supporting staff, man, I it was that in, in practice and then going through those first couple of games that I thought, man, we, we're, we're going to be okay. You brought up that SMU game later on in the year. Yes, that was an interesting time because Coach Frost was expecting his first kid right around that time. I think everybody was on baby watch. The baby could have been born at any minute. 
You got the undefeated season going on at the same time. Did you notice him a little more stressed at that time during those few weeks? No. No, not at all. And you got to remember, then there was people in the in the stands with University of Florida come to University of Florida, and so I mean, all that started right. It was in full tilt, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but no, I didn't. I didn't notice him being stressed stressed at all during that time. And that kind of leads me to a few weeks later. After that. Um, we're in Temple in Philadelphia, and we find out later that he actually had a meeting with, with the folks at Nebraska. Were you guys on the staff aware of that at the time, or was that kind of just just the beginning of the things? Uh, I'll I'll leave that one go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Coach. Coach, obviously a lot of good wins that season. Mackenzie had a lot of great performances. He went 24 of 26 against uh, against Austin P. Obviously that what he did to the Cows Black Friday was fantastic. The Memphis Championship game was fantastic. When you think about that 2017 season, which game do you think was Mackenzie's best? Which game were you, did you say, man, you put it together, this was your A-plus game? Ah, geez, I don't. I think the way he handled himself, um, going into this game that I'm going to tell you about and how he handled his health during the game was, man, it was about as good as it gets. And that was when we played Auburn in the Peach Bowl. Mm. You know, um, I mean, being down in the field with those guys now, and I mean, they're freaking just fast and and big, right? Well-coached football team. And, I, you know, the way he handled himself that week, the way he handled himself in practice, the way he handled himself during the game, that probably in my brain might have been his best, even though they were all – you know, the games go, man, you know, and then, and, and then you get the statistics. But, okay, fine. And you're on to the next game, you know. You get, you get five minutes to relax, and then you're thinking about your next opponent, you know. Yeah, that was interesting. The Auburn game was interesting because that was the first game I felt like, especially in the start, McKenzie looked nervous. He he missed a wide open uh, Otis Anderson down the middle, which had been a long touchdown. He he looked kind of nervous in that first part of the game, but then he settles in, right? Makes an incredible touchdown run, beautiful touchdown pass. I think it was the Snelson in the back of the end zone. What what did you say to him or what did you kind of do to, or what did he do, I guess, to settle in during that Auburn game? There, there really wasn't anything different when he would come to the sidelines. You know, I would ask him what he saw. We might review one or two things. Then we'd get right, we'd get right to the playlist of these are the next plays Frosty might call on first down, this on first or second down. This might be our first call on third and inches, third and two to three, four to six, so on and so forth, right? With regards to the the down and distance situations, with regards to third down. We would review that, right? Sure. And so he didn't he, you never want them to have time to overthink what just took place good or bad because the time for a quarterback to get irritated or celebrate is after the game let's stay focused on our job so during that game hey kz you all right bub yeah coach i'm fine you missed that one huh yeah coach i did okay let's get on with it man let's this is what this is what might be coming up and just keeping him focused on the game and not to dwell on maybe his nerves or whatever that might be, you know, and big freaking game. You're playing Auburn, you know, Those guys are ginormous and fast. If I remember if I, correct, you were always up in the booth, correct? So you were up in the yes. booth, you weren't on the sidelines. Right. Exactly. What was for you? What was the advantage of being in the booth versus wanting to be in the sidelines? Uh, I don't know. I I've always been up in the booth. I, you know, I, I, I was down on the field for I, when I was the head coach at De Anza for a couple of years it takes you a little bit of time to kind of readjust your, you see the game differently, right? You know, um, I've always been more comfortable than Booth and Frosty had no problem with that. Um, Cause basically I'm not basically, I'm just in communication with, with the quarterbacks, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, and then for me, I'm in a little bit, more placid environment, I guess you could say. I've, I've never been a crazy some bitch at all. Don't overreact. 
And the reason I say that is because if I can tell the quarterbacks, hey, don't get upset or get too excited until the game is over, I, I've got to be that way myself, right? Sure. And so I've disciplined myself over the years to just, okay, let's get on to the next play, man. Let's not worry about it. Let's just let's just move on. But when that interception happened at the end of that game in Auburn, good grief, dude. I thought I was going to have a <laughs> heart attack, man. I was so excited. You know, when that one was over, it was just – I don't know. It was just a great, it was a great feeling of something that was in a coach's career, right? How many guys get to experience an undefeated season, you know? And so it was, it was gratifying to say the least. Right. Uh, We know what happens next and we understand the decision that coach Frost had to make and and all you guys too leaving. But as fans, we always play the what if game. Like, what if everybody had stuck around? You guys had a good thing rolling in Orlando now. And you had a, the whole team basically was coming back the next year. We saw they still went undefeated the following year. How good could this run have been? It, it, say everybody just, just stayed in Orlando. You guys still be there right now? We're like talking about year seven, year eight, and you guys have been in the playoffs. Something like that could have been built there. Yeah. What if, right? <laughs> <laughs> If I had a lake in my ass, I'd go fishing. <laughs> I don't know, man. You know, it's yeah. just how how things play out. You know, I enjoyed my time at UCF. It was awesome. All the people were there. Mary, Mary, you know, the, the trainer. That's why I call her Mary, Mary. She's freaking awesome. She was the best. She really, <clears throat> really held KZ to get together, you know, (laughs) he got got banged up and boy, the treatment and the the care she gave that young guy, you know, and everything was just awesome. The facilities and just the weather and the whole shoot and just the whole vibe about UCF was just, was awesome. And I'm back, man. My wife yeah, I was going to say, so you, you guys are living in Nebraska. Is there any day you're, it's just freezing. You're you're going to practice, you're freezing your ass off and you're saying, well, man, we should just stuck around in Orlando. What the hell are we doing? <laughs> well, you, you got to remember now, you know, I was at, I was in Jersey at Rutgers and then I was at Northern Iowa. It, it's cold now. <laughs> You're so, a California guy too. You spent a lot of time in California. Yeah. Right? Most of my life, you know, and, and I'll tell you a funny story. We, we played, matter of fact, Chip Kelly was the offensive coordinator at, at New Hampshire at this particular point in time. I think it was 2005 and we had to go back to New Hampshire to play them in the first round of the playoffs. Right. FCS playoffs. And so we get there on Friday and it's not, it's not too bad. You know, it's a chilly sort of East coast day, man, dude, game day. I have never been that cold in my life. I, I was unbelievable. I, I, I don't know how the guys even threw a ball or even, it was just ridiculous. So that weather that, we experienced from here leading back to, to, to Nebraska, you know, my wife and I had, had, had been in that. So we, we, we knew what to expect. Now coach Becton, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, Travis maybe, but I, you know, I, yeah, it, it was, uh, it was different. Coach, obviously the lead up to the to the Peach Bowl was was unique. You know, Scott, Coach Frost, and 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 most of you decided to head to Nebraska, but stayed at UCF to to coach. I was seeing and see the season through. Can you just share how how taxing was that time for you as a coach? You've, you've got one job. You're trying to finish up something special with a, with a group of guys you really love. You, you're emotionally invested on both sides. Can you take us kind of through that period and what that was like for you personally, kind of coaching through that? Well, I know we got off the we finished the Peach Bowl with all the excitement that's associated with that, I'm on the bus knowing that I got to get on the road and recruit because when that happened and it was official to some degree, let's just say, um, I think it was the championship game. Was that right? We played against, um, Memphis. Yeah. So a lot of, I, I know you were, you were coaching a lot of the, uh, fans in the country learned like halftime at the game, uh, yeah. ESPN came on and had a report that coach Frost had accepted the offer for you know, Nebraska. And yeah. I don't know that assistants were mentioned, but at halftime of the game, most people were, were aware that he had officially accepted. 
Well, it was it was it was crazy all the way up until that moment. But what I'm trying to illustrate to you to some degree is I we we finished the game, we go to the hotel to do the sorts of things we need to do to make it official. I asked Frost, I said, Frost, are we do you still want to are you interested in Adrian Martinez? He goes, yeah. I, he goes, go, let's go. So what I, what was going on in my, man, my mind when I was on the bus in the Peach Bowl is I knew that I had to go out and see Adrian. Hmm. I wasn't going to have any time for anything, right? And then up into that period when we're coaching the game, it was it – was, we were just going all over the place, doing the best job we possibly could of recruiting the guys we could while we were still still coaching, you know. So we go out to see Adrian. It's myself and, and Coach Frost. The first time I went out by myself, and then he came out with me, and it was during that week of practice. And he was he was sick now. He had the flu. Or, he was he was not. Yeah, he was he was he was in pretty bad shape. Step in the house with Adrian and the family, and he boom, he perks up, and he's just as good as you can get, right? Leave, go back. We get to the facility to the facility at about five o'clock in the morning. We got practice that morning. Um, not too much of a pain in the ass for me because I usually got in the office at four fifteen anyway, so I just stayed there and got ready for practice. Frosty wasn't feeling very well. Like he slept all the way when we we're flying back from California. And um, we had, we had that practice. That's a little bit of the flavor. It was just, it was just nonstop crazy preparing for a bowl game against a tremendous opponent. Um, dealing with the emotion of the guys as, as best as you possibly could. So, one of the practices, it was supposed to be a, um, a, a padded practice or shells, right? Yeah. So the guys show up with just helmets. Like, what the hell's going on, man? I thought we were supposed to be in, in shells or pads. Make a long story monotonous. Practice is over. Frosty brings all the guys up and we're – sitting up in that corner of the end zone that's by the by the offices <clears throat> and um, he wants to get away from it so it's just it's just the team and he and he basically I wouldn't say reads the team the right act but just explain to them what was going on you know and we want to coach this team this is what we want to do and we expect you guys that if we're coaching the team. These are the things we're going to do to win this game against Auburn. Some of the guys spoke up and they talked. We got it all settled. Bang, 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 bang. And we, from that day on, we never had another issue. Yeah. How, how do you deal with that coach again to whatever you want to share? I mean, obviously, you know, once it, yeah, I'm sure there's rumors, right? You, you mentioned earlier, there were people from Nebraska at games wearing, wearing shirts and signs that said, you know, Scott, come home. I'm sure the players are starting to ask questions as a coach. How do, how do you handle that? If a player, if McKenzie's like, Hey coach, what's going on? Like, how, how do you handle that as a coach when you're dealing with business and your decisions, but you've got guys that you care about guys you're invested in who are kind of wondering the future. How do you, how do you sort of handle those kind of moments? Well, um, you gotta remember it was, Nebraska, Florida, Tennessee. I think there were two other teams where I would see fans with signs, you know. Uh, I really didn't I really didn't have to do anything as we relate to that because Coach Frost always kept the team abreast of what was what was going, what was going on, hmm. right? And so he never that I can remember put us as assistants in a position where the players were quote unquote being lied to in any way, shape or form. You, you know what I'm saying? Sure. He was, he was up front of, to those guys uh, uh, about those sorts of things, you know, as best as he possibly could be. And he was that way with us. He was really good with the staff. You know, he, he, you know, they're, <laughs> there are guys, they won't say anything to anybody on the staff about what their plans are. 
I mean, you, 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 hell, you'll read it in the papers, yeah. you know? And he was really, um, I give him a lot of credit for how he handled the staff and how he handled the team at that particular time. Yeah, Coach, Coach Beckton told us that. I mean, I don't, I don't know the setting per se, but that there was a conversation. It was simply, you know, hey, if, if, if one of us does this, we all do this, right? And we, we all go together. This is a, we're, we're a team as a staff. What, what made that staff so close? What made, what made everything just click so much with that, with that group of coaches? I, th I think, not think, part of it had to do with just how Frosty handled us, you know, right? He wasn't, Coach Frost was a demander, but he, he, he didn't do it with a sort of iron fist sort of thing, you know? And I, the guys he hired, I understood what needed to be done. They just got it done, right? Uh, like I told you, I kept insane hours, but that's just me. You know, that's just who I was. I just, I just wanted to make certain the quarterbacks – were the most prepared room in the country. So I, I spent an inordinate amount of time making sure that was taken care of. And I'll just I'll just relay this to you. I went into Coach Walter's office when we first because Troy didn't know me from Adam, right? He doesn't he doesn't know me. He's the offense coordinator, I'm the quarterback coach. And you guys know what that can be like. Sure. You know. You know, the, the offensive coordinator is thinking, this son of a bitch wants my job. <laughs> I went into his office and said, listen, Troy, I'm the quarterback coach. I'm not the offensive coordinator. I don't want your job. I don't need your job. I love coaching quarterbacks, and I'm going to stay in my lane. If you need anything from me, I don't give a shit what it is. You ask me, and I'll take care of it for you. Otherwise, I just want you to know that. Because I understand how that relationship can go, Troy, and I don't want that getting in the way or in between you and I. And I would suspect that that was probably a mutual feeling in sort of different dynamic ways with maybe a lot of guys on the staff. I don't, I don't know that, right? Yeah. Well, but you know, those, sort, those sorts of things can tear a staff apart sure. faster than you can click a finger, you know? Yeah, I mean that and that staff stayed together for obviously a lot of the Nebraska years as well. I know some some guys came and gone and, and throughout the way, but uh, you 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 leave Nebraska in 2021. So catch us up with what you're doing now. Where yeah, I was I I you're was, back uh, in Orlando, I was, right? Uh, you know, K, uh, Coach G and 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 Lubes and Ryan Held were known as the goats. You know, you guys, think you're, still, you're back in Florida now. <laughs> <laughs> you guys didn't get that one, did you? <laughs> Yeah, I'm back in Florida. I'm, I'm back here, and Kate and I got here, um, I think it was December 18th, which was fortunate, you know. Um, we were able to sell our place. We weren't sure if we were going to get here before Christmas or when it was going to sell, yada, 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 all how that stuff goes, right? But it was, it was great. The realtor did a great job for us, and we got back in here in December and, uh, of, uh, of that year. Yeah. And love it here, having fun, enjoying it. We 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 run 40 minutes a day, every day, exercise. We go to movies on Tuesday, go to New Smyrna Beach on Wednesdays, um, and just enjoying each other, man. Having having fun. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to coaches every now and then. Like I said, I, I speak with Lubes and and G and and, and Ryan Held. Uh, Coaches call me from across the country every now and then to ask about this or that, you know, um, ask if I'm doing any quarterback sort of camp sort of things anymore. But I did those for so long and they, to do them right takes a, a, just a ton of time. So I'm not in that mode right now, you know. Sure. I think I finally got that that goat's uh, joke you just made, Coach. But um, do you still uh, <laughs> just it just kind of clicked how you how you said that. Um, are you still in touch with Co uh, Coach Frost? Do you, do you and Coach Frost still have an opportunity to, to chat? No. 
All right. Well, we'll leave, we'll leave, we'll leave that one there. <laughs> I, I can take from your, uh, your answer, your answer there. But before we let anyone off our show, Coach, we do a rapid fire question segment. It's a, it could be movies, music, sports, trivia. Right. It could be anything in the world. You never know what you're going to get. So are you prepared for our rapid fire question segment? Lord only knows we're going to find out real fast, man. All right. Well, my first one for you is uh, you've got a, a what looks like a very uh, a very nice cigar in your hand there. What yeah. what, uh, what what do we got there? What's uh, what are we smoking on? This is uh, an Aroma de Cuba uh, El Jefe, and um, they've been in my mouth for a long time. I used to dip, you know. Oh, okay. And so my son said, "Dad, you got to stop dipping." Sure. Right? So that that was okay. Done. So the cigars helped me a little bit with that. What I yeah. found out about them, it was uh, Winston Churchill's cigar of choice. Hmm. I Good found out. Yeah. I'm, I'm a cigar idiot. Uh, what, what's a cigar like that cost, Coach? What's a, what, what's a cigar yeah. like that run? Yeah. These aren't too bad. They're about eight bucks, nine bucks. Okay. And it'll last me, they're about maybe that long. Sure. They'll have phase. Yeah. So it'll last me three weeks. You know, if I do nothing but chew on it and or smoke it after a good pasta dinner and glass of red wine on Sunday. There you go. Yeah. How long has it been since you quit dipping? Because we know Frost was a big dipper. Were you got were you <laughs> dipping when you were in Orlando too? Uh let's see, when did I stop? Um it was in Iowa, northern Iowa. I want to say maybe around 2012, I guess, somewhere thereabouts. All right, so yeah. it's been a while. Yeah. But he asked me, you know, and I said, okay, man. <laughs> uh, cold turkey, right. brother. Cold turkey. That was Ooh, it. Wow. Yeah. Good for you. That's the way to go. All right. So you mentioned you lived a long time in California. You're back in Florida now. Which one has the best beaches? Which beach do you prefer the most? I, I, I tell you what, man. My wife is a California beach girl, and we love New Smyrna Beach now. You know, I'd never been around where you can drive your cars on the beach, right? Sure. And that's just, it's freaking awesome. And, you know, the I don't do real well with cold water. <laughs> so the water on the Pacific coast is, could be cold up in the Bay Area, as you well know, you know. And so we enjoy the, the warm water and, uh, of the Atlantic and the Gulf. It's, yeah, yeah, I, I, I enjoy the Florida beaches. Absolutely. When you're at UCF coach, did you get a lot of time to sort of walk around campus? And if so, did you have a favorite spot, kind of a go-to spot that you loved uh, on campus? Uh, no, not really. I used to run every day on campus and then Kate would come with me sometimes and we'd, we would run around campus. But the thing, that, and then our son, you know, he, he, he was at Northern Iowa, then he went to Europe, Missouri, and then he got his undergraduate degree in biochemistry at UCF and then got his doctorate. Uh, in pharmacy up at Florida. Now he's making a boatload of money as a pharmacist. <laughs> but the thing I told him when I first walked on campus, I said, Charles, man, this place is like a freaking resort, man. This place is <laughs> absolutely beautiful, right? You know that uh, the big fountain where they where they put the ducks in the water and all that? Yeah, re reflecting pond, yep. I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that area right there. And I'd, I'd go there once in a while. But as a ball coach, man, you know, you're like a mental patient. You know, you, you 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 get in the office when it's dark, right? For me, anyways, 4.15 in the morning. You leave when it's dark, and then they let you out of the asylum in the playground yard for like a three hours a day, and that's it, man. You know? <laughs> it's, it's just crazy. So you don't get to see too much stuff in that regard. All right, you hit me with a saying I never heard earlier today. If you had a lake in your ass, you'd go fishing. What? Give me another one of your a Mario Verduzco classic line that probably I've never heard before. <laughs> oh, I got I got some that I can't say on here. <laughs> you can say them. <laughs> they're, just, they're just crazy, man. And you know the guys uh, in the quarterback room. You know, it's such a it's such a tough position to play with so much pressure. It's actually the easiest position to play in all the sport. The thing that makes it so damn difficult is the time requirements that are necessary to be good, right? To be effective and efficient. So I always wanted to make certain that those guys, when they meetings were not drudgery, 
I mean, they wanted to come to, to the meetings to see what my crazy ass was going to do from meeting to meeting. Mm-hmm. Right. And they, they, they understood how hard I worked and how hard they worked. And we were going to have some, uh, some fun and levity along the way. So there was all those sorts of things. If I had a lake in my ass, I'd go fishing, you know. And <laughs> if my aunt had balls, she'd be my uncle and those sorts of things, you know. <laughs> yeah. Coach, you were the, the subject of an article by Bruce Feldman in The Athletic that was titled oh, yeah. uh, uh, The Scientific yeah. Method of Mario Verduzco. Obviously, at yeah. that point, you, you were in Nebraska. Um you obviously talk a lot about theories and, and concept. What, I'm curious, what kind of feedback, what kind of comments did you get after people read that article and got to kind of, who maybe didn't know you very well, kind of understand a little bit about your thought process as a coach? I, I, I <clears throat> what they didn't realize was this, the science that supports everything we do. Right. Um, I think that's what, at least the comments that I would get, that's what was fascinating to them about that. Whether I'll give you a crazy ass example. Okay. You want a crazy ass example? Hit me. All right, let's go. So you, you guys golf. Yeah. Uh, not, not well, but yes, but you're right. So, so yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a closed environment sport. Yeah. Yes. So if we're talking about motor control, learning behavior, which is the, the science of underlying things that justify your teaching, let's say, of what you're going to teach, right? That's a closed environment sport with a whole set of different methodology about getting a golfer to get better. Yes, 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 right? Yes, yeah. Yep, yep. Playing quarterback is the most open environment sport position in all of sport. There's nothing like it, right? Well, you know, in, in, in basketball, the guys can wave their hands in your face, Right. Well, you're trying to shoot the ball, but the basket's not going to move, correct? Sure. Right? And then in, in hockey, right, they, they get to check you. So there's some physical, legal contact in, in hockey, but the, the, the freaking net's not going to move, right? No. And in golf, some guy's not going to jump out of the bushes and whack you upside the freaking head, right? Not unless it's Happy Gilmore. Move. No. Yeah, yeah, you're right. The, the cup's not going to move. But just think what we got to do as quarterbacks. We have to drop back. Keep our eyeballs focused downfield, throw the ball to a moving target that's being guarded. Well, five or six maniacs want to rip your shalong from your body. <laughs> no good. And as soon as you start thinking about those guys, you might as well just be a running back. So just understand that 99.9% of the coaches in the country use closed environment methodology to coach their quarterbacks. Does that make any sense? It does not. No. One of the other things I learned in this article too, is that um, you, you have a list of things that, that people hold true that you say are myths, such as carrots, uh, eating carrots can improve your eyesight yes. and that you should starve, a, a, a starve and feed a cold. Yeah. Is masturbation, that, is, is that true? masturbation causes blindness and we could go on with a few more right? <laughs> <laughs> eating chocolate creates acne and you know, um, so on and so forth. Yeah. Is there, have you ever thought about putting a book out, Coach? You're like making like your own like coffee table book of like the Verduscoisms or, or anything like that. Well, I started. Uh, matter of fact, Bruce asked me about this when we were when he came to interview me. I started it in the early 1980s, 79, when I just n- noticed this sort of madness for how guys were coaching the position generated by how I saw Coach Walsh do it and what was underneath that. So I just decided to do all of the sort of scientific research, whether it was in biomechanics or motor learning and control or cognitive psychology, um, exercise physiology, and so on and so forth, right? So that that started and then got finished with my master's thesis. But what the master's thesis was just, as I told, like I told Bruce, I said, I just had to get this, this stuff out of me. I, just, I had to get it on paper, right? It was, it was just driving me nuts. But as a ball coach, you know, you don't get time to, 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 to work on it on a consistent basis, right? You're asking about the book. So now, <clears throat> since I've been back, 
I've had time to do that. It's, it was always, over the years, it's basically done. There's five chapters of the book. Um, the one that's been the hardest that I'll finish here at the end of the month. Um, in the original document, there was about a 300 page document of just about the philosophy aspect of it. And I had to compress that son of a bitch into, it's about 70 pages right now. It, it was just really difficult, really, really damn difficult to do. But I'll finish that here in February. So when it's done, I'm not going to go to a publishing house and do it because I, if you're Bill Walsh and, and you're Bill Walsh and they're going to pay you to you know, publish, you know, you know, Bill Walsh can get 25%. Sure. 30%. But that's Bill Walsh. It is. What are they going to give me? What? 5%? That ain't happening. For my life's work? No. Ain't gonna, no, it's not going to happen. So I'll publish it on my own. I'll sell it by the chapter. Um, each chapter will um, of the book because a guy might be into, a coach might be interested in the biomechanics, but he's not interested in the motor learning control and behavior. Let's just say, right. Um, he, he might be interested in the drills, but not necessarily the science that supports it, which I think would be an error, but that's, that's my bias. Right. So they can purchase whatever chapter they want. They might want to purchase the, the cognitive, uh, psychology chapter in the cognitive domain of learning because they want to understand about keys and reads and how that works and how our brain works to apprehend making the fastest initial response to a defense as possible. So, yeah, it's crazy, man. It's nuts. Can, as long can I get an autographed copy? As long as I get an autographed copy. I'm like, <laughs> of course. Okay, okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, coach, if I was having a karaoke party at my house this weekend and you were coming over, what song are you singing? I'm singing All the Young Dudes by Martha Hoople. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, when, you, when you're watching a football game, what's your, what's your go-to meal? What are you, what are you, what are you oh, eating while you're watching a game? God, it just depends, man. But, uh, you know, I make the best meatballs in the world. So I'll tell you a funny story. So when the quarterbacks would come over, they come over to take their quarterback test, right? Right? Sure. Yep. Uh, we would have a feast. So Italian wedding soup, mm. rigatoni pasta and meatballs. Um, my wife makes the best uh, burritos in the known world. Um, mm. My mom helped her figure that one out. What, uh, what, goes, what goes in the burrito? What's the, what are the, what are the... Well, here's the thing. It's, it's nothing but pork. But a okay. buddy of mine in high school... He called them iguanas for whatever. I don't know why Buddy Keith is crazy. So Keith <laughs> just nicknamed Keith. them iguanas. Sure. So what's hilarious now is we started doing when the guys would come would come over. Going back to my days at, at, at Rutgers, right, in Northern Iowa, and everywhere, they come over. I would say, okay, guys, we're going to have a – might be their first time taking the playbook test. Hey, guys, we're having iguana. And they would look at me like I was freaking – what do you mean iguana? Yeah, we're having iguana. I just want you to taste it. It's delicious. You're going to love it. Right? <laughs> So when that first group, it, it would happen to that first group, let's say that first group of quarterbacks at, at UCF, let's say, right? They experience that. The next quarterback comes in. Everybody else knows what agu iguanas are, but we wouldn't tell that son of a bitch, right? <laughs> so he, you, you could just see him at the table and all the other quarterbacks are kind of laughing underneath their breath, man. This guy's going to try iguana for the first time. <laughs> So, yeah, iguanas, we, that, that's delicious, uh, but all, all sorts of different things. Uh, this past weekend, uh, Kate and I had uh, hot dogs on a Saturday and, and hamburgers and then hot dogs and hamburgers on the Sunday. So it, 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 it varies. It varies. All right. Uh, NFL now down to the final four. Yeah. Who do you like to win the Super Bowl? Whew, I don't know. To tell you the truth, I yeah, I don't know. You don't have a team you root for, right? Most coaches don't have an NFL team they root for because I guess they have too many connections with different guys all over the league. And well, you have it. You know, I, I grew up a Raider fan, mm -hmm. so I've been a Raider fan all my life, man. It's been some dark days now, but yeah. uh, half the family were Niner fans, half the family were Raider fans. I was half of the family was Raider fan. 
right? So that that's the team I enjoy watching. But when I'm, when I'm watching a game, I just watch it as as entertainment, you know, because you don't have all the camera angles that you need to make an analysis and a judgment of what really t- took place, you know. Quarterback throws a pick. Oh, that he sucks. Well, yeah, but he's just getting blasted by the freaking defensive end. Just re- so you never know, and you never know if the guy ran the wrong route, mm-hmm. right? He didn't go deep enough. Was supposed to, break. so you just never know. So I just watch it for entertainment. But I, I, you know, the the way based on that sort of level of of analysis, I, I just think the way the Lamar Jackson and those cats are playing with the Ravens is pretty special right now. I, I think they, they might, they might have the edge. It just seems to me, don't know if that's the case. I think he's really disciplined himself over the years to be a, a, a quote unquote effective and efficient pocket passer. Sure. Right. Uh, which now when you complement that with the way that guy can run, man, that's, that's hard on defense, man. Do you think Our they coach. should be broadcasting games like with the all twenty-two camera or from the end zone view? Yeah, it would be it would be great if they could if they had a wide a wide shot, you know, where you could see the safeties and the quarterback in that shot, just like when we're watching game tape, hmm. right? Because then what happens when they cut off the secondary? You, you can tell a lot about what the quarterback wants to do or what he should do by the distribution of the safeties, let's just say, right? Well, sometimes you can't see them. You don't know what the hell's going on, yeah? And if they could do it where you you had a wide-angle shot and then you had the end zone shot, oh, man, I'd be – that'd be awesome. I'd be in freaking <laughs> heaven, yo. It'd be great. All right, so that's why I watch games. I just, I just watch them for entertainment. Don't get too critical about it and all that. Just, yeah. Cause you just never know, man. You just, you just never know unless you're in that, you're in that film room after a game, knowing what took place and who screwed it up. <laughs> well, coach, we appreciate you joining us. You've been really generous with your time. So I'll get you out of here with this last question. When you think yeah. about your, your two seasons at UCF, what memory will you take with you the most? What stands out the most from your time at UCF? Aside from, uh, aside from, the win and how we won it at the Peach Bowl, you know, and, and we're undefeated, right? The sort of uh, the joy that brought not only to the team and the staff and all that, but all the fans, man. <laughs> I mean, they were they were they were great fans. Now, I mean, those guys were awesome, right? I I just remember. KZ after that game. Hmm. And we shared a, a brief hug and I didn't get a chance to see him after that. Yeah. I, I hadn't, the first time I saw him, I think was two years down the road. Hmm. But I just, re, I re, what happened in my brain was, because you're asking me that memory was the difference between how we, he and I walked off the field together in the cure bowl and how we walked off together after the peach bowl and that he understood that man, all the hard work and how we did it, the way in which we did it made sense. And he was just overjoyed. That's 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 beautiful poetry, Coach. Well, you're back in Orlando. Did you yeah. keep any of your your old UCF gear? Do you still have any of the old UCF stuff laying around the closet there that you oh, can sure. rock from time to time? Oh yeah, yeah. So when Kate and I go running, um, I have my little UCF, my white UCF shell, okay. right? Yep. And um, got a couple of the mock turtlenecks that I'll that I'll wear when I'm out. I shouldn't say it's a run; it's more like an old man shuffle, but it is <laughs> forty minutes of work, but. Yeah, you, uh, I, yeah, absolutely. You still anywhere? Uh, still wear any Nebraska gear? Uh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, Coach, <laughs> we appreciate you taking the time to, to join us. Thanks for walking on memory lane and giving us an education on a bunch of different things. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to catch up with you real soon, but definitely appreciate you taking some time. That would be great, man. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you.